Hi, Lenny. Sorry about your loss. Look for me on television. Please don't talk about me when I'm gone. Pretty baby, don't bother me. Today, I've been given another chance, and I know exactly what I have to do. Out of the car there, pilgrim. I am a stand-up comedian. You ain't no stand-up. Not yet, but I'm on my way to Las Vegas for the Monty Guy auditions. Was I a speeding officer? Ah! Hey, how about you open for me? Oh! Oh! Destiny's calling. It's time to get up there and shake your stuff. Welcome to the stage, Lenny Freeman. Get off the stage. You suck. You could be my manager, Hitch. I don't enter into contracts lightly. Now, please, stop me if you heard this one before. I can't go right now. Doesn't surprise me. Nobody ever leaves this place. What seems to be troubling you? I have never been in trouble. And now I'm in the worst kind of trouble ever. No, you ain't, Lenny. Yes, Lenny. I am, Hitch. No, you ain't, Lenny. Now you are. Open the truck! There's only one way on our contract. This is insane! Do it! Look at me, I'm busting a gut. Give it up one more time for Jim. Let's yeah, hear it. One more time. Give it up for his good looks. Yay. So, you know, I'm not sure if people could tell from the trailer. I've watched the movie. This is a big, a much different character yeah. than I think people are used to seeing you play, a much different kind of project than I think people are used to seeing you be a part of. And you are a producer on it, which means that you really went out on a limb here. You yeah. really wanted to, I think, maybe do something different. Yeah, uh, the, the role is very different. It, it begins, for those who are Parks and Rex fans, it begins very Jerry-esque uh, and quickly stops being that. And he, uh, it's, it's kind of a movie watching a man break down, mentally break down. Uh, he's put into a world that he knows nothing about. He's an innocent, sweet little man whose mother dies, and she always told him he was funny. So he's going to be a stand-up comic in Vegas. That's, he's going to head to Vegas and do it. On the way there, he meets a... Well, he, he picks up a hitchhiker. Biggest mistake he will ever make in his life. And he, this hitchhiker becomes his manager, per se, and he does terrible things. But the worse things he does, the funnier his stand-up becomes. And so it is a question of what will you pay for the price of fame. Um, and so to play this kind of role, for me, you know, I had done parks for seven years. So the timing was awesome. It was like, okay, hey, Hollywood, I can also... Be the crazy SOB, you know. Um, I can't get rid of the good looks. That's just nature. God did that. <laughs> but uh, I could, uh, it, it was just a way to, like, you know, put your acting chops out there. And this uh, really stretched what I'm normally used to doing. So how did this come your way? Ned Crowley, who wrote and directed it, wrote this for me over 10 years ago. We've been friends since the mid-'80s. We did comedy in Chicago, Second City training and everything. And... He wrote this and he sent it to me and it was awesome. And I was like, oh, that's great, now what? <laughs> no one cared. And then Parks came along. And because of Parks, I got some notoriety and you know, recognition or whatever. And then some producers came on board and said, if you can get O'Hare attached, we'll make a movie. Wow. And so it all just came together and they said, we want you to be a producer on it, which I will never do again. Let's I talk about that. I hate that part of it. Let's talk about that because I, I love filmmaking and the whole yeah. process and I love the stories behind the scenes. So. Uh, based off of your tone when it comes to producing, what happened out there, man? No, it was, first of all, it was a tough shoot. We did this in the desert. So, fat people in the desert, it is not good. <laughs> it's just not good. And there's sweat involved. I mean, I'm, it's air conditioned in here and I'll be sweating in here. So imagine 107 in a, in a 1953 Olds. Um, but this like in the summer out there? We shot in the summer in the desert. Yeah, Palm Day. First, first decision as a producer you might have wanted St to make was November. Yes, in or the, or how desert. about a winter film yeah. somewhere where it's cold? <laughs> no, but um, w producing is really tough. Like there's a lot of uh, you have to figure out a lot of stuff. I'm generally lazy, and so I took on the role of taking care of the actors. That was where my producer brain, if that's even exists for me, that's where it went. So I made sure we had okay trailers, that we had decent food. Uh, because I don't like the day-to-day -day nightmare of when things go wrong, it's on the producer. What are you doing? What happened here? What, why is this person upset? Why, I, I, 
I, I'm not a confrontational person. What do you mean we can't get into that location? Exactly. Want to shoot there right I don't want to hear about that. I really don't. I, and also in this film, good or bad, and if you hate me, it's bad. I'm in every scene except for three. Yeah. So I had a lot of on my plate already, you know, just to be in front of the camera. So I will never produce again. There we go. I've said it. I've at said a, it. I mean, at a certain point, I think when it comes to producing, when you see other other actors who are in every frame of a movie, also on board as a producer, it's. I always assume that it's mainly because they've harangued other people around to do the physical job of producing, and that's how they got the production. The producer right. and their because, name helps sell a film, yeah. which is fine. And that's I think what was happening with me initially, but I did want to be involved with. The actors, like for auditions, I auditioned with them. There was no actor who did not read with me. I just thought you had to, I just wanted to do that. As an actor who has auditioned over the years a billion times, you want that connection. And a lot of times, um, you know, casting directors will bring in a reader or something, and sometimes it's just not so great. And I think it can ruin an audition. So I was definitely there for everybody's audition. But the thing I keep saying about this film, are there any Walking Dead fans here? We have any, some out here? Yeah. There's two people in the film from Walking Dead. Josh Fanatic Walking Dead fans, Fanatic clearly. Walking Dead, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah, Josh, I mean. Josh McDermott and Andrew J. West are in this film. And uh, Josh plays Eugene on Walking Dead. And Andy played Gareth, the uh, cannibal. And these guys, here's how amazing these guys. Well, I mean, who doesn't like a little bite of a friend? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's don't rule it out. Uh, these guys came in. The word, This was a SAG ultra low budget. So there's no money. No one's... No one's paying their rent with this money. They came in and they insisted on auditioning for us because you know you get to a point uh, where you get offered a lot of things, you know, and you don't actually have to audition all the time. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but a lot of times you get offered. And since we weren't paying next to anything, we just assumed they're all going to demand to be offer only. So they were our two choices. They insisted on coming into audition. They wanted us to see what they were going to do with the role. So I was blown away by that, and it was a good lesson for me to learn. And uh, when you see this film, Andrew J. West, uh, where is he's up here, if this, I keep saying, if this were a big studio film, he would be nominated for an Oscar. I think he's brilliant in this film. And uh, Josh McDermott, who plays T-Bird, is just a dick. I mean, he is a son of a bitch in this film. And Annie Dudek is the girl, that lucky girl, got to spend three hours underneath me in a car in the desert one night. What a treat for her. It's a good scene, but holy crap. Oh, Lord. You know, and people don't get it. We're, you know, when you see these scenes, like this is, there's a scene where the two of us are in the back of the car and we're about to get it on. And, that, you know, that's all it looks like. But what's happening is there's, you know, a 250-pound DP on the other side in the car with you. So nothing is private or personal. So it's all just, and I never get the leading man role, so I rarely get the girl. You know what I'm saying? That is not the acting world I've ever had. It's still kind of not. And, and this yeah. one is kind of not either. There's a line where she goes, oh, I don't know what I'm doing because she has a boyfriend. And I look and I go, I don't know what I'm doing either. But I mean it because I don't know what I'm doing. Right. My character has no idea what he's doing. Now, without giving anything away for those who haven't seen it, you know, yeah. when having done Parks for, I think you said seven years, right? Seven seasons, uh, yeah. Seven seasons on Parks where you're generally playing just a really great guy, like just a really good human being. Yeah. What is it like when you sit down and watch the end of this film, the final shot of this <laughs> film? How does that feel for you to see yourself sort of portrayed this way or playing a character like this? Well, seeing as Jim O'Hare is not so nice, it is good. <laughs> uh, no, it's not that I'm not so nice because people always say, are you like Jerry from Parks? Jerry's a sweet man. I, I certainly hope I'm that. I hope I'm a sweet man. He's loyal. I hope I'm loyal. But Jerry is milk toast. You know what I mean? Like, Jerry is very simple. Uh, I, you know, I, I say fuck sometimes. <laughs> I might have even said cocksucker once or twice. No, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I swear and do stupid things. So You're human. I'm a human being. Jerry is just too perfect for that, you know. And um, but was there something cathartic about after seven years of yeah. watching your beat your yourself on screen as a, a, a nice milk toast man, seeing you as like potentially a psychotic? The best. The best. <laughs> My humor is dark. My humor is dark. I go blue generally um, when I'm talking to people. So to do a dark comedy is that's my wheelhouse, you know. I'm, that being said, I'm always happy to do any comedy. I, I, it's, it's paid my bills for a lot, a lot of years. So, and I love getting a funny script, and I love seeing what I can do with it. But then to get this kind of script, 
which was the good and bad of the script was when we finally got to do it, it's all on me. Like, if I did not pull this off, we do not have a film, at least a film we want to release. Because, again, I'm only not in three scenes. So there was, I, I felt that pressure every day. But Ned Crowley, you know, I said, wrote and directed, he, uh, he guided me, and he's known me a lot of years. And as he will tell you, he knows my actor bullshit. And so he... Who is your actor bullshit? Every actor has bullshit. When I say bullshit, it's, it, it's just things that... Uh, it's comfort zones. So it's something I might do a lot. Maybe it's a movement. Maybe it's a, this. It's, it, it could just be... Uh, you know, you'll see actors watch. Uh, um, um, what's her? Oh, I'm going to forget her name from Weeds. Anybody? Hey, Louise Parker. Always holding something. Always holding something. That's hers. Right. It's a comforting and it makes your performance. You feel comforted. It's not a bad thing. But he knew all mine. So when I would go to something that was comforting, he'd go, oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. You're not going to do that. And that helped, I think, mold the performance. And he also made me go smaller than I'm used to doing. I'm used to, you know, I'm, I'm a comedy guy, so I'm bigger than life sometimes. And on a network sitcom. And so, on a network yeah. sitcom, yeah. And I've done... Seven years of being... Even though it's subtle for most network sitcoms, it's, it's still, still a big. sitcom. It's yeah. still a wacky. I, I fell and split my pants and farted. I mean, that is, you know... <laughs> Getting a burrito in a river one day. So, um, no, I was mugged. Truly, I was mugged. It had nothing to do with the burrito. But, yeah, so it, it's a different style. It's a totally different style. And Ned kept me on track, which was great. And we also lucked out because we had a DP, a director of photography, who makes this film look so good for no money. I mean, no money. And uh, I think it looks like a big film. I really do. We're really proud of it. It looks like a Coen Brothers film. Totally. We love, that's a good comparison. Uh, a lot of people compared to Breaking Bad, that style, and Ned wrote this before Breaking Bad ever existed. He's just, we couldn't do anything with it because no one cared. Well, it's, it's chalk filled with pop culture references and a sort of cer a certain sense of Americana that felt to me like I was telling you in the green room, like a certain set of 90s sort of murder rampage uh, road trip movies like uh, The Doom Generation or Blood, Guts, Bullets and Octane, Love in a 45, and even a little bit like, like, like Pulp Fiction, yeah. obsessed with references towards what we would call Americana at that time. Yeah. I think even specifically in this film before a shootout, there is in its entirety a scene from Five Easy Pieces Absolutely. spoken by <laughs> two characters. Word. Word for word. <laughs> yes. And, and now, I, I don't know if I missed something, but is it even called out that they're doing five easy pieces? No. Or they're just it's doing just it? It's just Ned's homage right. to that type of film. There's a, it's throughout. Yeah. If you, yeah, it's throughout the film. And those who... Ca it's like, what do you guys call it? Um, tur what is it? Easter eggs. Is that a thing you yeah, guys Easter say? Easter eggs, like, yeah. Like, things that only certain people are going to get. Yeah. There's a lot of Easter eggs in this thing. And so... Um, I love that. And I'm still seeing them sometimes because yeah. I don't, I didn't necessarily get all the references when I did it. And so now it's like, oh, damn, that's you what that is. You have a favorite that you, that you recognize now? That's my favorite. What you five did, easy the five pieces. easy pieces. But I did know that one when we first did it. Oh, that's if classic. you've seen five easy you, pieces, yeah, there's classic. no way to not make And that's a point that. in the film. There's um, something happens in the film with the waitress that, in my mind, it's you're watching the film and you're thinking, oh, this film's dark. Ooh, hopefully funny, but okay. And then something happens right at that moment. And to me, it turned, it's like when you go, oh, shit, things just got real. Yes. Like now we've seen who he is. We've seen who he is. And now it's going to, you know, shit's going to hit the wall. Things have started turning before that moment, but Absolutely. everything turns. But I turns. think that's when you realize, oh, wow, anything can happen now. And I love a film where anything can happen. I love like on a Game of Thrones, which, spoiler alert for a season, can I... Do a spoiler on the first season? I think so, yeah. When the dad oh, yeah. gets killed. I'm like, well, no, he'll, he'll survive this guillotine because he's the lead. Right. Bye bye And that's when you realize <laughs> go in anything eight. can happen. I love that. Can I, another reference that uh, maybe it was intentional or not that I felt at the end of the film, again, without giving anything away, yeah. was the king of comedy with, with Robert De Niro yeah. and that his, like, homemade... Uh, talk show studio, exactly. which you kind of get a sense of at the end of yeah. the film as well. Uh, and again, not to give too much away, but my character Lenny, um, you know, he, he's trying this comedy. It's not working. Bodies start piling up. He becomes funny. People are loving him. Uh, not funny because of jokes. Funny no. because he's just telling the stories of bodies of how on these stage, bodies are piling and up. People don't think it's. They think it's funny. People think it's avant garde. Like I'm doing some crazy bit because I'm covered in blood. And so at the end, uh, Lenny has. He's broken down. He's mentally broken down, and he sets up uh, a tableau that's pretty interesting uh, with all the characters. 
I love that yeah. last shot. I love those, the last two shots. I and I'll tell you this, Ned, uh, Ned, when we did it, uh, he was, his daughter was on set. And he was feeling very, he was, I just feel like, is this so misogynistic? Like all this terrible thing are happening to the women and blah, blah, blah. But even the actresses on set were like, no, no, no. You've written this dark film. This is how it has to end. If you don't, you're cheating yourself as well as the audience. And so he went dark. Yeah, absolutely. There's even a kind of, uh, I mean, if, if you're talking about King of Comedy and homage, in terms of a dark comedy, Taxi Driver, in the sense that there's the moment of the fantasy of like where it could go. Taxi Driver has always been, people question whether or not that's the reality at the end of the film, or if that yeah. is he died and that's the fantasy outcome that he wanted. And there's a bit of that going on at the end of, at the end of this there are, well. And I can't give this away because it really would give it away, but there are two theories that go around about this film. And I love them both. And when you pick it apart, they don't make sense. But when you, I mean, if you, when you really pick it apart, it, it, because certain things, well, how could that then be? But when we first heard it, because you know, you make these movies, you don't know what people are, you don't know what people are going to take away. We, at, we will always tell you, we just want to make a decent movie, get invited to a festival, and have a beer afterward. That was our hope. <laughs> Little did we know, we go to the first festival, we win the whole damn thing. And then we go to the next festival, we win the whole damn thing. So this all came out of nowhere. The you know because you get so close to a project that you don't know. It's like, you know, I do theater, and by, you know, the third week rehearsal, people are like, how's the show going? What do you think? I don't have a fucking clue. I don't know. <laughs> it seems good we're laughing at each other. People were I laughing. Don't I don't know. People were laughing, but, you know, now you put in front of an audience, and you don't know what the response is going to be. And so we, um, we were blown away by the response to the film, and, and uh, just so honored, because, you know, we crowdfunded, and strangers... People we have never met in our lives gave us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we had other money. Well, you guys, oh, okay. So you had but money on top. We had of money that. on top, but we wanted to be able to really give the look we wanted. We needed another one hundred and fifty thousand. People who liked me from Parks. People who, I mean, it's who liked you know Josh and Andy and Ann gave us their money. I will be forever grateful. Who does that? I mean, money's hard to come by. We're all working. We're all trying to get by, and they gave us their money and. Um, so I, I, I do feel we, we gave them what they were looking for. So, I mean, I do feel that I have never heard from one investor that they were disappointed. If anything, they're, they all seem very happy that they were involved. Unless but, they didn't read the script and thought it was well, going to no, be like Parks or something. They did not see the script. We did show them the trailer because we shot a trailer first so people would have a clue of what this was going to be. Because, um, right, you don't want people giving it thinking it's a, a Parks, yeah. you know, ripoff, and then all of a sudden, you know, the blood and guts and all that good stuff. No, people knew what they were getting, but um, I don't know. I'll, I'm humbled by that. I, I, people who just know me from TV sent me their money. I, I think that's incredible. Let's talk about TV for a second, because you had a, a long career before Parks. Yeah. Long. You've been acting at least... I'm 104 credited. years old today. <laughs> He was my uh, birthday today. He was in the uh, Lumiere film, actually. Yes, the it was. Voyage <laughs> to the Moon. I don't know if you said, his face actually was the moon. Um, but when you, what was the audition for Parks like when you when when you did it? Well, the word came out that Amy Poehler was going to get a sitcom. She had been on SNL. She had just had a baby, and so it was kind of you know the talked about property during pilot season because some of you hear more about than others, and so. I got to audition for Ron Swanson. Now, those other Parks fans, you guys know who Ron Swanson is, obviously. Yeah, exactly. And can you imagine anyone in the world other than Nick Offerman playing Ron Swanson? I mean, it makes no sense. But that's how they did it. They, uh, and they always wanted Nick, but the networks make you see all these people just that's how they do it. Oh, well, that's how they, also how they kind of did The Office, right? Where you, like they, you basically everyone went in and auditioned for like the central characters. Michael. Yes. But then whoever they like, they sort of built other characters exactly around them what in happened. the back. Yeah. So I go and I read for Ron. I, uh, you know, did my take on it, which I, I, I people are like, what, what did you do? I, it's got to be out there somewhere. I wouldn't, if someone has it, release it. I wouldn't mind seeing it. I'm sure I look like an ass, but still. <laughs> but I remember thinking I was very stern. I do remember being stern, where Nick brings such a um, stern warmth. I think I was more stern than I was warm when I think back to it. But so that you do that audition, you go home, life goes on, you do other auditions, then they get a call saying they want to see you again for Parks and Recreation, which I think at the time was the unnamed Amy Poehler project, and uh, for this role of Jerry. Okay, so I go in, and of course I was hoping I'd get to the audition, it would be down to me, like me and just another guy or something. No, there's a bunch of people. Because you're right, they take what they saw in the initial auditions, you know, for Ron Swanson, and they're like this guy or that guy or this da 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 da, and so we're there. And then, um, 
the word is, I've heard them in interviews later say that uh, Mike Sher and Greg Daniels created the show, and Greg said to Mike, let's put him at a desk. It'll work out. <laughs> and it did. And so that's how I got on Parks. And uh, Retta and I, who plays Donna, treat yourself. Um, she and I were in the same boat. They hired us, and we're very honest. You guys, we don't know what's going to happen. You're not going to come out as series regulars. We don't know. We have to establish these six people. Because at first it was Rashida, Amy, Aziz, Aubrey, Nick, and at the time, uh, Paul Schneider, who played Mark Brandanowitz. And I feel like none of those characters uh, were, I mean, defined as to who they were, or like, I mean, in terms of how they became iconic in some way, until the second season. Second season. It wasn't season. until the second season where you could see the writers were like, this is who Aziz's character is. This yeah. is who, I mean, even Amy Poehler's character in the first season is much more of like a... a Michael Scott. Yeah, and they were, that like was Michael never Scott. the intention. But because we did six without a pilot, the pilot is where you shoot the one episode and then you, you figure things out: what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we didn't do it. We did six in a row, so the same voice was there. I always tell people: start with season two, but go back to season one when you're done, because there's some great stuff in season one. But I think for especially for Office fans, it turned them off. Like, no, 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 we already have an Office. Yeah. We, don't, we don't need another Michael Scott. So I think season two is the way to go, and then go back to season one. There was also something uncomfortable about watching Amy play a Michael Scott type of character. It was, there's like yeah. a, a warmth that she naturally has. I mean, Steve Carell has as well, but also the, uh, the positioning of this woman at, as the head of the Office and not being competent and qualified right. at her job. There's something a little more uncomfortable about that. Especially because, like, on The Office, and I'm a huge Office fan, there was competency around Michael. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, Leslie is dealing with Ron Swanson, who doesn't even want there to be a government. He, you know, he just wants to shut the whole damn thing down. You got Jerry. What the hell is he doing? He don't know. He's just licking envelopes, waiting to go home to Gail that night. You know, uh, Retta's doing her nails. So, yeah, no, we needed her to be the brains of the operation. And season two, that all comes... It all happens, yeah. And how was the whole experience of Parks and Rec for you, the seven seasons that you were on it? Other than the other actors not being nearly as good as me, um, I mean, God bless them, they tried. They tried, God bless them, they tried. But I am exceptional. No, I'm joking, of course. It was, um, it was seven years of laughter, tons of love. We, we would start laughing in the hair and makeup trailer at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning until they were wiping it off at night. Here's how I always say I know how much I love this show. Uh, we shot single camera, which means you're in some scenes or you're not, so some days you'll be off. If you do multi-camera, you're there every day because you're going to be with an audience later. We shot single, so there's no audience. So I'd get the schedule on a Friday for the next week. It's called D-O-O-D, -O -O Day Out of Days. And if it said, like, oh, I'm off Thursday, I was like, oh, damn. Like, I would rather have been there. Because not just the cast, but that crew, we, we kept 85% of the crew from the beginning unheard of. And that's because Amy and Mike Shore set the greatest tone for a set that I have ever seen. I know people on shows, uh, comedies, where it's tense and ugly. And I'm like, how do you do comedy under those conditions? You know, and we didn't have it. And, and not that shit didn't happen in life. You know, people went through things and... But still, especially Amy, she brought that smile every day. She took it on as her responsibility to lead. And if she's being kind and wonderful, how the hell can the rest of us not be? One of my favorite stories is one of the producers, you know, if we had different directors, a lot of times we had the same director, but they would bounce in and out. And this, so the producer checked in with him and said, so how's it going? And he goes, well, it's good, except... Sometimes it's hard to get them to stop talking to each other, like to do the scene. And our producer said, if that's the worst of our problems, things are good here. We'll add the extra time at the end of the day if we have to. But the fact that our cast just wants to hang and still be with each other, all is good. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Hey. Uh, I'm such a huge Parks and Rec. And, uh, Listen to and that voice. <laughs> I'm such a huge box of red fat. <laughs> wow, nice. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, if after, doing, uh, after being Jerry for seven seasons and now doing this movie, how was it for you to have a different mindset from being such a sweet character to somebody who may be psychotic, maybe? Oh, very much maybe. Uh, <laughs> no, great question. Uh, you know, we're actors, and we get... Um, 
I'd like to think I can do everything. I've done shows where I've cried. I've done shows where I was happy, sad. Uh, I was on an episode of a show you guys probably never heard of called Diagnosis Murder. I was, the, I was a uh, serial killer. So it's so great to get those opportunities to do because we're actors. But, you know, actors are, every actor has their own way, you know, their own, you know. So like some actors you work with, they need to stay in character the whole time. So if they're playing like a crazy person, when they yell cut, they're going to go off into the corner and stay by themselves. I'm the guy who I can just have sliced your neck open, and I'm like, Kill, I've just killed you. And they yell, cut. And I'm like, what time is lunch? You know, like, I, I don't, uh, I, I can come and go. For me, that's how, that's my process. Other people need much more time. Um, there's a famous story where Dustin Hoffman was uh, a marathon man, and he starved himself for three days. Oh, yeah, the, and Lawrence Olivia. And Lawrence yeah. Olivia. And he starved, and starved himself for three days and kept running and running to be exhausted, blah, blah, blah. And so Lawrence Olivier said to him, what are you doing? He goes, well, the character, blah, blah. And Lawrence Olivier goes, just act. Yeah. <laughs> just act. The job is acting. Act, act like you just did for three days, like you haven't eaten for three days. So I'm more that guy. I can just act. Um, and I love, love, love getting the opportunity to do different things because... Uh, I am a, you know, I don't know if you noticed, I think these cameras are making me look overweight. I saw a picture of myself. Uh, no, I, I, I'm a big guy, and so I get the character roles, and that's awesome. I, I love character roles. So to get the opportunity to do more than just the typical fat, funny neighbor is always a treat. Always a treat. What was diagnosis murder? Dick Van Dyke. See, you guys will not know. I thought so. Dick I, Van Dyke, yes. I saw Norm MacDonald live the other day, and he talked about diagnosis murder yes. for like 15 minutes for it some reason. It was awesome. Dick Van Dyke, who, I'm sure you guys, when you were young, you saw Mary Poppins, right? He had the terrible English accent. The, the quote my English accent. He was the chimney sweep. And he would be sitting in the dressing room singing songs from Mary. It, it was, I, I love old timers. Like, I'd rather sit in a room with you know, a Dustin Hoffman and a Dick Van Dyke rather than a Brad and Angelina. I, I, I don't know what to say to them. These guys, I want to hear the stories. I want to hear the stories of the old times. So that was a, such a thrill. And I got to play a really, oh, a piece of crap. Like, I literally say to him, I'd, I'd, I'd kill my wife if I could get away with it. I mean, I'd literally say it to him. And uh, I actually at the time thought that that was going to open some dramatic doors for me because it got a lot of good response. But the next week, I was doing another comedy. You know, and again, that's awesome. I love comedy, but it's so fun when you can do some other stuff. Absolutely. Next, uh, next question, right here. Hey, Jim. Hey. Uh, congrats on the movie. Can't Thank you. To check it out. Um, I was wondering, like, after getting to do a lead role, do you think you'll be able to do uh, more of those type of roles, like, in the near future? Well, great question. Obviously, I should only do lead roles. Can we all agree? <laughs> Are we all in agreement on that? Yeah, I think that's how it should be. No, I am. Um, it, 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 Here's how I can answer that. People after Parks were over, like, wouldn't you like like a, a Jerry spinoff or something? I love an ensemble. I love an ensemble. They've always been my favorite kind of shows to watch. Your Cheers, which again, you guys are probably too young, but you know, I love an ensemble. So it will not be tough to go back to a group thing. And in a way, the four of us were a bit of an ensemble, but it is, it's mostly me and Andy and, uh, but no, I like I, I like doing it all. The the thing about an ensemble is, you know, it's not all on you. There's other, <laughs> like I did. Um, I have a film. I did the Soderbergh film that's coming out. It's called Logan Lucky. Everybody's in the damn thing. Channing Tatum, Chan to me. But anyway, uh, you can call him Mr. Tatum, especially you. I could see you were going to call him Chan. Don't do it. Uh, no, what a sweet man. But so him and, and, and Daniel Craig, you know, 007, and um, uh, Driver. Adam Driver and uh, Catherine Heigl and, and Hilary Swank and, and uh, McFarlane, like, whoa, scared the crap out of me because that's really heavy hitter stuff. But I'm in that, and I'm, I play uh, Chan, Chan's boss. <laughs> and um, it was awesome. So I just, I like doing projects. I like to, the thing about these indies, you know, there's ways to make money. You can do a big budget film and there will be money. You can do a TV show and there will be money. These kind of films you do because you love to act and you can really take a bite out of a performance. Uh, I think I have time for one more question right here. 
Hi. Hey, dude. Um, so I was just wondering, since you've now done you've done theater, you know, television, yeah. movies, is there like a specific like type of acting, or is it just like, or is it just acting? It's just acting, but that you prefer now that you've been able to experience yeah. basically the full spectrum. Oh, good question. Um, I love it all. I love. Uh, I'm going to head to Kansas City in November to, for three months to do a play called Funny Money. I will love every minute of that. I'll, uh, between then, I have a couple things lined up. One is a comedy, one is a drama. I will love that. I, I, I'm kind of a whore. I, and I, but like a whore who enjoys his work? You know, maybe they do too. I don't know. I, 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 I haven't whored myself yet. Okay, there was one night on Santa Monica. Whatever, don't judge me. Don't judge me. No, um, I do love it all. Uh, I love giving the opportunity. If someone said, you know, Jim, here, look at this pilot for a sitcom, and it was awesome, I would love to do it again. Um, I, I did a couple episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine this past season, and it reminded me of how much I love being around the same people every day. You know, you do a play, a couple of weeks of rehearsal, you perform for a couple months, bye-bye. Same with the film. I was in Atlanta for three weeks, and then bye-bye. Um, whereas a show that goes, that's fa that becomes family. And I do, I'm that type of person who likes to be around, because, you know, I love busting balls all day with idiots that I love. And, and by idiots, I consider myself one, too. It's not a slam. I, 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 idiots are my people. So, um, who made you laugh the hardest on the park set? Pratt. It, it's an easy answer. Uh, it, he is so off the cuff funny. I'm sure. Has anyone seen the outtake of the Kardashian video? Yes. Is there anything funnier than that? <laughs> there is not. And the best part is when Nick and I, because it takes a second before you, you're like, what? Oh no. Oh no. He did not just say that. So Pratt was off the cuff funny. Um, but Amy could, Amy could mix it up. Amy could change up what she was doing. And I don't know. We, it's so weird because I feel they were all incredibly talented, funny people. Aziz, you know, Aziz, who you guys obviously would all know, Aziz Ansari, I didn't understand him as far as his talk. And by that, I mean all the set because, you know, well, with Jay-Z last night, I don't know who these people are. I'm the old man on the set. So I go to his show at the Orpheum in L.A., and I'm, you know, sitting there, and he's doing his thing, and the people are losing their shit all around me. And I'm like, I don't know what he's saying. I don't know what he's talking about. And then you start here. Uh, he's brilliant for his a for his fans. You know what I'm saying? I'm just too old to get half the crap. <laughs> but he also would kill us because Aziz, we could be in the middle of conversation. Like right now, if Aziz were me, he could go sound asleep during this conversation. <laughs> He could go sound asleep. Really? The, the Aziz can sleep anywhere. Absolutely. And during a scene, off of a scene, doesn't matter, he can go to sleep. I know one other person in my life that can do that, and I am so jealous. Because you imagine how productive you can be if you can do that. Yeah. You can just... But I also think it's because he's up all, all night. So he's so damn tired during the day, his body just shuts down. But they were off, you know, Nick Offerman and the way his cadence, just his cadence can make me laugh. And Bretta, Bretta became my girl um, because our trailers were back to back. We both started with a question mark over whether we were going to be regulars or not. So we bonded pretty quick. And I just had lunch with her last week. And uh, she's got a new series called Good Girls coming out mid-season on NBC. Everyone has been, the show has been a gift for all of us. I mean, Amy obviously had a big career before the show started. Chris Pratt, he was uh, not working. He got six episodes, and the producers were like, why isn't this guy in the series? we got to keep him. He was hired for six. He was going to live in that pit, <laughs> and then he was going to get the hell out of there. That was the plan. Well, he's the guardian of the galaxy. Right. He is Jurassic Park. He's some other big thing that I can't reveal yet that's going to be happening. I mean, it's amazing what the show has done. So... Um, I look back and, and, and you know, because you know how like on Facebook and stuff, it really reminds you of some wonderful stuff. And I'll be, how was that five years ago or seven years ago? Because it did fly by. It really flew well, by. Well, seven years ago was not that long right. of a time, especially yeah. like considering you're talking about someone going from like the guy that's going to live in a ditch for six episodes to the biggest movie star in, in the, the world. world. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, you know, it takes some of people like 20 years. Oh, if ever. No, no, no. It, it, it's it's amazing. And, and these are his stories to tell. But Chris Pratt is, he's a food person. 
and the boy can eat. And the boy, <laughs> the boy likes to be fat. And so, you know, here he is on Parks. He starts out, not fat, but yeah. jiggly, whatever. <laughs> And then, you know, he did Moneyball where they said, okay, you gotta, we're going to bring in a trainer. you got to boom. So he does it. Looks great. Comes back to parks. 30 pounds overnight, he gains. <laughs> that's what Pratt does. He eats. We all do. We, you know, you're on set, craft services, all this crazy stuff. Then he gets a call for 30 dark, zero dark 30. Dude, you're going to be working out with uh, Marines and, and SEALs and everything. So he does it, boom, 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 boom. Comes back to parks, 30 pounds like that. <laughs> and I kept saying to him, dude, this will end because your body will not, con you know, yeah. he's still young. At some point, the body's going to go, we ain't doing this anymore. <laughs> so then when Guardians happened, he stuck it. It's been, he's looked amazing now for a while. You know? I mean, not like me, but he looks okay. <laughs> Jim, I gotta let you go. Middleman is so How wonderful. How dare you? I'm ready to be let go. You want to stay? All right. Yes. I'll just leave you. Jim's gonna stay. I'm out of here. And then we're done, right? Yeah. And I do want to say this. Chris Pratt owes me the fact that he's married to Anna, because I, Anna Ferris, is Chris Pratt's wife. I did an episode of Friends with her, before he ever met her. So he's lucky I didn't work my magic. <laughs> because Anna Ferris could have had this. Instead, she's with Pratt. How can people see Middleman? Uh, Middleman is out and, until tonight, actually. It, it leaves theaters. It's tonight's one. No, till tomorrow night. Tomorrow in night? In theaters and in New York. It's at the Empire 25. It's in eight big cities uh, across the country. Then we're going to do video on demand, I think, in August. And then October will be Netflix. So it'll be out there. Congratulations, Jim. Thank Jim O'Hare, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> That's great. So much fun.